Hello. Yes, I think everyone can hear me now. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Fenton, who's the Managing Director of Monkey, and Lindsay Gaines, who's their Senior Developer. They're going to give a case studies presentation on Zoos Victoria. Um, without further ado, I'll ask you to make them feel welcome and uh, hand it over to them. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for coming along. Um, so today we're just going to talk a bit about a large Drupal project that we built last year. So um, I'm Matt and this is Lindsay. Lindsay is one of the senior developers who worked on the project and he was the, uh, the project lead. So I worked on it for about six months during the life cycle of the project and you know, continues to work on it today. So um, just a little bit, a little bit about us, um, where we come from, we're Monkey, we're a digital agency. So Dries was talking about some of the, the big agencies, we're a sort of a smaller boutique agency, um, around 20 people. Um, we're from Melbourne, um, uh, otherwise known as Under a Rock, I think, from this morning. At, um, we, we work with a lot of clients um, countrywide, so we work with the ABC um, here in Sydney, also the Australian Greens. Um, as well as a few other clients. So um, some of the sort of things we do, sort of typical digital agency stuff, so design, development, um, strategy, as well as sort of, um, a lot of content management builds. Um, the sort of organisations we work with are typically in the sort of arts, cultural, creative space. So um, people like the ABC, we've built a couple of large Drupal sites for, uh, ABC Pool, which is a big community site, and also Radio Australia, which is their big um, sort of media and news presence through the Asia region. Um, we've also built sites for the Australian Centre for the Moving Image, ACME, uh, which is at Fed Square in Melbourne, the Australian Greens, as I mentioned, uh, and also Breast Cancer Network Australia. We um, maintain a large Drupal site for them as well. There's us on a hill, um, just opposite our office. We don't spend that much time there, but it's nice to get out sometimes. Um, so, yeah, just a bit of background on the project. So, Zoos Victoria, they're obviously a zoo, but they're also an organisation that runs several zoos in Victoria. So, they have three main zoos. There's the Melbourne Zoo. Um, Melbourne Zoo's a really old um, zoo. It's, in fact, it's the oldest zoo in the country. It's the eighth oldest zoo in the world. Um, Hillsville Sanctuary, um, which is sort of out to the east of Melbourne, out in the Yarra Valley, that's their sort of native animal zoo, so you can get that sort of experience with, you know, kangaroos and koalas and native animals. And then over to the west of Melbourne is the Werribee Open Range Zoo, and that's sort of the African Plains style zoo um, with all the animals from that, from that region. Um, so one thing about the zoo, and, you know, it's something that, you know, when we first started talking to them, we were really interested um, you know, to, to hear from them. It's something we were thinking about. It's like, you know, you know, what do zoos do these days? Like, we probably all went to them when, you know, when we were kids and that was all fun looking at animals. But, you know, you sort of grow up a bit and you think, is it good, you know, that animals are kind of, you know, in cages and, and that sort of thing? Um, and it's, look, it's something that the zoo think a lot about as well. Um, and it's, I guess, as, you know, as time has gone on and they've matured as an organisation, They've, they've realised that, you know, what is it that we do and what, what do we stand for? And I guess the prime thing that they stand for is sort of protecting animals and also protecting endangered species. So by sort of promoting and... Um, sorry, um, by sort of, you know, promoting awareness of these animals and certainly the endangered species and sharing all this information um, with other zoos and with other research organisations they're actually doing a lot of good and they're, and they're saving these species. A lot of the animals that you find in Melbourne Zoo are rescue animals anyway, so they might be animals that have been mistreated or that were, that were sick and they've sort of nursed back to health and that sort of thing as well. So their goal um, is to become the number one conservation organisation in Victoria, um, so sort of an organisation that, you know, isn't just a zoo, it stands alone as a, as a conservation organisation. Um, so the website, as, it sort of, as it's been historically, it's uh, been, you know, hugely important for an organisation like the zoo. Um, you know, obviously it's a really big communications tool. So anytime they want to broadcast messages about, you know, new animals uh, being born, um, that sort of thing, you know, the website's the main port of call there along with their social channels. Um, 
it's also a huge uh, revenue driver. So I'm talking about ticket sales and also memberships um, and donations. And finally, as I mentioned before, just promoting the conservation message. So since Zoo has sort of realigned um, what they stand for, everything that the website does and all the messages that go out from the Zoo have to be aligned with this conservation message. So the website's been really important. Um, However, the, the old site um, had a lot of issues. Um, it was five years old when, when we came on board. Um, it was running on a, on a .NET uh, proprietary CMS called ADX. Um, they were having a lot of trouble with it. It was constantly crashing. There was constant downtime. The user experience was really ordinary, like, you know, pages could take minutes to generate. Um, so it was kind of, you know, killing any kind of good experience and any goodwill they had from their users who were going to the site. Um, had limited support for vendors, so in fact I think when we were brought on board they were down to sort of the last vendor in Victoria that could actually uh, manage and maintain the site, so that's not a really good position to be in. Um, and I guess from an admin perspective, um, the site, you could sort of do whatever you wanted on the site, like you could, you know, create pages and change the structure, change the style. You could do anything and there were a lot of administrators who had a lot of power to do this. So the site sort of evolved organically into this sort of chaotic mess. Um, so they basically had too much control and they needed to be reined in on the new site. Um, finally, they had a lot of manual processes. So, so the zoo sort of structure is there's sort of four properties. There's the Zoos Victoria as an organisation, then there's the three um, sort of property sites, Melbourne, Healesville and Werribee. They share a lot of content. Um, this content was being double handled um, manually, so they couldn't sort of say, all right, let's publish to this site and that site. There's a lot of copy and paste or, you know, going via other kind of text documents and things like that. So a lot of mistakes and things were creeping in like that. Um, there's the, uh, the old site there, um, showing its age a little bit. Um, it's, uh, that's just taken from archive.org, so it's actually missing one of the key images. But yeah, it was, um, look, I think it served its purpose for them for a long time, but it was obviously um, time to change to a new site. So when we brought on the, the we, we, we sat down and had a lot of workshops with, uh, with Zoos Victoria, and, and here are some of the things that we, we came up with, which were the key issues. Um, it's a real high traffic site. Uh, it's getting up to 20,000 visitors a day and those visitors generate 50,000 page views a day. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of traffic. Um, it needs to be true 24 seven uptime. And look, uh, you know, it's kind of cool. A lot of people say, yeah, this site needs to be 24 seven, you know, it can never go down. Um, with Zoo, that's actually, you know, that's, that's actually the reality because they're open 365 days a year. So, for us and for them, we needed a lot of uh, comfort to know that on Christmas morning, for the people who were thinking about going for a, um, you know, a picnic at the zoo that day, the site wasn't going to go down for some reason and we were going to get a call as we were opening our presents. Um, so, yeah, so that was a big consideration, um, you know, when they were assessing different CMSs, that they really needed a CMS that was, you know, that was stable and could be up, you know, 99.99% of the time. Um, as I mentioned before, they've got a sort of a structure with, you know, the, the parent organisation and the three zoos. They've got a lot of complex content. Like, they've got great content, all these fantastic, you know, great images of animals and information on the animals. But it's complex to organise that. It's also complex to sort of intertwine this conservation message as well. So that was one of the issues we identified. Uh, the site also integrates with a lot of other systems, ticketing systems, donation gateways, um, and systems to control uh, the screens around the zoo. So there's a lot of things that Drupal needed to integrate with there as well. Um, the site also uh, had a very limited budget for development, um, limited time and a fixed launch date. Um, last year was the 150th anniversary of Melbourne Zoo, so they were determined that they were going to have a new site for their 150th anniversary. We were brought on in February and the site launched seven months later. So it was a really quick turnaround um, and they had a, a fixed date which was the school holidays uh, in September. It's the busiest time of the year for the zoo. Um, and yeah, we managed to hit that date without any issues. So that was a real credit to, to Lindsay and the, and the team for doing that. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the design of the site um, later, but just so you've got some context, here's, here's the new site here. 
This is when you go to zoo.org.au, so it's the sort of it's the portal for the other three sites. Obviously, if you Google Melbourne Zoo or Hillsville Sanctuary, you know you'll go straight through to that page. But if you just type in zoo.org.au, uh, this is where it takes you. Um, so I think one of the interesting things, hopefully, we can talk about today is why Drupal, um, the zoo, was on a sort of a proprietary CMS, and that had sort of mixed experiences with that. Um, so I think you know it, we found it quite interesting as well, just just talking to them about why they had reached that decision that they thought Drupal and they thought open source seemed like good options. And we, when we came on, we helped them sort of refine those recommendations. Um, I should point out that as an agency, we don't deal 100% with Drupal. We, we're a, an open source agency, so everything we do is open source. But we're typically building sites in Drupal. WordPress, uh, Magento, for e-commerce, and also for other sort of more complicated sites with, um, uh, you know, like complicated back-end systems for registration and things like that, we will deal with Zend Framework. So they're the sort of main tools we use. Um, so from the client's perspective, they'd, uh, they'd done a lot of research. Um, they'd spoken to a lot of similar organisations, um, and they'd spoken to Taronga Zoo, who'd already moved to Drupal at this point. Um, and what they discovered was um, this concept of open source um, was something, and the philosophy around open source, is a bit like what Drews was speaking about this morning, so they really related to, and that, that concept of, of doing good. So as a zoo, they're sort of learning all, this, all these fantastic things about animals, but they're sharing that with other zoos and other research institutions, uh, universities around the world. Um, so that concept of sort of, you know, of doing good, of the community sort of contributing to something larger was something that really appealed to them. Um, it had had a really good uptake from similar organisations, so, uh, you know, other festivals and, and, and events and destinations. Taronga Zoo had had a really um, uh, positive experience with it. Um, unlike their previous CMS, it, they felt it had a large number of vendors, and so, you know, you can see there's, there's a lot of people, say, at DrupalCon, um, over these next couple of days who can build sites like this. Um, they're typical things like they were looking for certain features and plugins which, which Drupal seemed to cover off on quite well. And, um, you know, as with any sort of decision like this, um, you know, cost and time came into it. It seemed like a really good cost-effective solution for an organisation without huge budgets. Uh, they are a non-for-profit organisation. So for them, um, you know, sort of looking at, you know, possibly something like Sitecore, which would have cost them, say, $50,000 in licensing, that was appealing, um, you know, that, that they wouldn't have to spend that. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about why we sort of helped them solidify this recommendation for, for Drupal. Um, so Lindsay worked with the zoo a lot during this initial scoping phase, as well as the build, and he's just going to share some thoughts on this. Um, yeah, as Matt mentioned, we work with a few different systems, and obviously every time you approach a new project, you've got to evaluate what they need and figure out what's going to be best for them. Um, one of the big drivers for us to go with Drupal was the variety and complexity of the content that the zoos was going to have on their site. Um, you know, they've got a bunch of animal profiles, they've got events, they're running campaigns, um, I think we ended up with something like 15 content types uh, in the end, so that's obviously something where it's a huge strength of Drupal. Um, the other thing was there were some really well-defined relationships between these different content types, um, and when you can leverage those kind of relationships uh, and help kind of place dynamic content on pages that's going to be relevant or give people some more tailored calls to action on each page, uh, that's obviously a big win for them, and that was something that Drupal made possible, uh, which would have been hard to accomplish in some of the other options that are out there. Uh, the Zoo's organization also had quite a few different user roles that they were going to need. Um, they're a large organization. They've got kind of um, a marketing and promotional department, but they've also got people there like zookeepers who are, uh, sorry, yeah, zookeepers who are generating a lot of the content. Um, so we needed kind of a few different types of user roles, um, all kind of under the umbrella of an editorial staff and then a final tier of the people who actually have the ability to publish this content to the live site. Um, so again, Drupal has incredibly uh, strong features there and that was another really big reason that we decided to go with Drupal. 
Um, Zoos Victoria also has kind of a long-term strategy that involves not just their website, but things like mobile apps and uh, other kind of content um, consumption devices. And we wanted something where the content was going to be portable to these other systems. Um, obviously, a lot of things are moving towards web services, and we wanted to, uh, to put something together for zoos where they would kind of have one place for their content editors to, to put everything, and then we'd be able to pull it out into all of their other apps and systems. Um, lastly, everyone knows that Drupal is really popular due to its modularity. Uh, not only are there a bunch of modules already available, but if you want to add new features to a Drupal site, you don't really have to worry about messing things up when you roll out a new module. And because they've got this kind of multi-year strategy with the website and their other uh, tools, uh, we knew that we'd be doing ongoing development with some pretty major features. So um, that was the kind of last thing that capped it off and, and really solidified the choice for us. Um, I guess we'll talk a little bit about what we did during the project, uh, take you through kind of the strong points. So, um, yeah, so in a nutshell, um, the sort of tasks we had to do for a site this size um, was a complete restructure um, and organization of the data. So, so there was a big content audit and we encouraged the client to throw out as much as they could, um, and which they were quite willing to do, but it, you know, it, was a, it was a big effort to do all of that. Um, we went through a really sort of detailed IA phase and really just looked at, you know, finding out what their users were doing and then sort of prioritising um, those pathways and calls to action so that, you know, everyone could find what they were looking for quite easily. Um, we went through a new design phase, which we'll show you some of the designs um, in, a, in a little bit. Um, obviously, it was a Drupal 7 build. Um, and then a, a training phase. Um, and then load testing, which actually ended up being a, a really um, kind of crucial phase of this project. Um, as I mentioned, you know, they need this sort of true 24-7 uptime. So everyone got a lot of comfort out of the fact that when we load tested, we took it up to 3,000 simultaneous connections. So it's 3,000 people, like, you know, at the exact same time using it. And that was, it, it, it survived fine, even with that sort of amount of testing. So. Um, so that was really nice to know, and that sort of held it in good stead for some high traffic events that they've had recently as well. Um, so then finally um, deploying, and um, yeah, they had a you know a sort of a, a kind of complex server set up, a sort of you know production and staging and live environments, which Lindsay will talk a little bit about as well. So um, we had seven months to sort of plan, design, and code. Um, yeah, it was a really short turnaround. Uh, thankfully, we had a client that was um, really motivated and really engaged and was able to turn things around really quickly. I think that was really important, like had we not been working together and had there not been that sort of level of trust um, between each other, we, it would have never launched on time. So yeah, like the zoo's got fantastic content as I mentioned before. Um, and some of, the, some of the things we did in Drupal to sort of manage this content, I'm just gonna get Lindsay to sort of go through. Yeah. Um, so. There were two main focuses for us with Zoo's content. Uh, first of all, they've got great content. They've got a lot of really nice stories, um, beautiful imagery. They've got a huge um, media database of videos and like really stunning photos. Um, so they've got this great content. That great content also comes from great content producers. Uh, it's a large organization. As I said, they've got zookeepers and a lot of different people who are involved in that because their old website was kind of this clunky thing. To, to put a page together, you had to select a template and put all this stuff on the page. For a lot of the people who were less technically savvy on those teams, it kind of drove them away, and it, it, it didn't encourage them to engage with the system. So one of our big focuses, and one of the things that Drupal really enabled us to do, was give them a clear and easy to use kind of content creation workflow that helped those people who were creating the great content really engage with the system. Um, it also helped us kind of reduce a lot of the kind of rambling hierarchy of content that they had generated over the years um, by kind of condensing what they had and uh, like organizing it in a better, cleaner hierarchy. We were able to really like just give them a much easier navigation system and then augment that with a few really key calls to action on several pages. Uh, as Matt was saying, we looked through their analytics data from their old site 
looked at the most commonly requested pages, and we also looked at a lot of the pathways that they went through um, over like their visit to the site and made sure that on some of those key landing pages, we put the calls to action right there um, to get them to the most commonly used destinations. Um, we had this short timeline, and we had a lot of stuff that we wanted to do. So we decided to go uh, with kind of a, a phased development approach. A lot of times you go pretty sequentially from um, IA through to design, then you rack the whole development sprint before you let the client get into the system. Uh, we didn't really have the time to do that, so what we decided to do was, as soon as the IA was finished, we had our designer get to work on the visual designs. While he was doing that, we went straight into the back-end development and started putting together all of their content types um, so that by the end of the first phase of development, we actually launched a site um, to the live site that didn't have a theme or anything like that. Um, obviously, when I say live site, it was our live environment, but it was still hidden from the public, um, and their old website was still like on their domain name. What that allowed them to do was they got their content editors in there. Um, as Matt said, they had this huge body of content from their old site. They went through a massive content audit, and what that involved was selecting what to bring over, but also condensing a lot of these big groups of pages down into maybe one or two more streamlined pages. So they had a lot of work to do getting a lot of content into the site. Um, so in the second phase, they were busy doing that on this pretty bare live system. Um, and in the second phase of development, we worked on getting their theme set up, uh, a few last content types, um, and putting a lot of the functionality and polish into the site so that when we actually launched our second iteration to the live site, the database was completely populated with all of their content and images. Um, and when we kind of hit that deploy button and refreshed the main page on their live environment, it went from like this blank site to like a fully formed website uh, just in one go. Um, that was really pivotal for us to be able to get the site launched and running on time. And we had done that once or twice with big clients before, but it's always a bit of a risk. Uh, but it worked really well for us on this project. Um, as I said, we kind of had to focus on this idea of content portability, the idea of uh, being able to get them to enter content, say, about an animal. The animal content type on this site has something like 20 or 30 fields, everything from the name of the animal and some nice images and a little blurb through to things like their species, their family, their um, genus, uh, their conservation status, is the animal extinct, things like that. Um, one of the things that's really great about Drupal, and specifically Drupal 7 that we built this in, is that each little piece of data that you enter in is stored in its own field. When you go to render that um, either to a web page or pull that in a service to somewhere else, you get to pick and choose you know, which little bits of content you're going to display. So for example, on our animal page, which you can see on the tablet there, that's on the website, it shows everything that they've put in. But if you go to visit the animal, um, that same animal on their iPhone app, you know, we've just got an image, the name, and like the text blurb. And that's something that, again, coming from a system like ADX where a page is a page, and that page includes template, style, and a bunch of content just mashed in, it's really hard to pull out those little bits of data and use them across a bunch of different platforms. Um, yeah, so the main benefit of this, obviously, is that they're content creators. They just have to put that animal in once, into one system, and we can push that data out to all of their other um, apps and stuff. And it gives them kind of just one interface that they have to learn and one interface that they have to use. Um, that's a huge benefit for an organization like Zoos. Our development workflow um, at Monkey, we use Jira, which is a, an issue and task tracker. Uh, we basically you know, just break those functional requirements into the tasks, assign them off to developers who you know, work on the features, close the issues. Um, we've also got the client in JIRA, so they're able to see um, at times the progress that we're making on a bug uh, and communicate with us about how they want a feature to work. Um, our version control is in Spring Loops, which is a hosted subversion service. And uh, it's got kind of one-click deployments and all that stuff, which 
it takes a huge part of the engineering of an organization like ours and makes it something we don't have to think about. Um, I, I highly recommend using something like that if your organizations are at all doing development. Um, all of our developers work on VirtualBox LAMP servers, so everyone's running their own mini Linux server on their desktop. Um, by doing that, it means that de the developers get a lot of flexibility. They can set that up any way that they want. It won't affect any of the other devs, but it also means that the system that they're developing and testing on is as close as possible to the live environment that it's actually gonna be launched to. Um, and it also means that de the developers get to learn a little bit about Linux and the system that those things are gonna run on, um, which is invaluable when something happens on the live site and you need one of the devs to investigate or whatever. Um, so once they've written their code and done a commit, we deploy it to our staging site. Uh, staging site's where all the QA happens, um, but it's all of the content is kind of dummy content. It's not ever gonna be pushed to the live site. So they do all their QA there, and then once it gets, once each feature gets signed off, we schedule batch deployments to the live site. Um, the live site is hosted on a VPS infrastructure that basically just involves a load balancer, uh, currently three web servers, and a single database server. Uh, the load balancer is obviously really important when you don't know exactly how much load you're gonna have at any given time. Uh, you can start big and scale back if you figured that you've allocated too many servers, or if the load of your um, site is kind of growing over time, which they often do, you can throw a fourth or a fifth one in there. Um, on each web server, we're running Apache, which is where Drupal sits and, and renders all of the content. But Apache also sits behind an Nginx instance on each server. Um, Nginx is serving all of the static assets, so things like images, JavaScript, and CSS files that don't change very often. Nginx is really, really quick at serving that kind of static content. Um, the other thing that Nginx is doing is it's caching uh, the pages that are generated by Drupal um, with kind of a medium lifetime. When, so that means, obviously, that when a page gets requested, it gets generated by Drupal, stored in Nginx, and then delivered to the client. Um, under times of high load, it means that that page is only gonna get requested once, and Nginx can serve like thousands of them per second. So when the site's not under a lot of load, it doesn't make any difference having Nginx there, but when you've got 100 people requesting the same page um, really quickly, it means that Drupal doesn't have to do any more work than just one page render, and that was absolutely pivotal to um, being able to handle the kind of load that zoos gets in their peak periods. Um, I'm gonna quickly try to go through just a couple of the modules that we use to build the site. Um, this is the complete list of contributed modules that we're using. It's maybe a smaller list of modules than what a lot of Drupal sites get because we decided that we wanted to shy away from using a module where we were only gonna use, say, 10 or 15% of the features that that module offers. Uh, we didn't wanna include like a lot of code bloat into the system, and we decided to only use modules where we were either gonna be using a significant percentage of the features that that module offers, or we chose modules that just offer one like key streamlined feature. Um, everything else we tried to put into custom code to make it as streamlined as possible. Uh, so we used the revisioning module, which is uh, kind of an addition to your content workflow. It gave us a lot of flexibility in our user roles in being able to give people the ability to create and edit pages, but for those pages not to be published. Um, so we segmented the publishing permission to only a small group of people who had the final authority on each of those pages, and revisioning gave us a lot of what we needed straight out of the box. Uh, Entity reference is a tiny little module for Drupal 7. It just allows you to add a field to a content type that um, you can reference another bit of pre-existing content. Again, because uh, Zoos had a lot of these really clear content relationships, this one was a total no-brainer for us. Uh, it's in almost every content type uh, because almost all of them relate back to either an animal or a property. And um, this is one of the things that really helped us get those kind of contextual calls to action happening, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. 
Uh, we used the media module for Drupal 7, which uh, is like a really great drop-in module for managing things like images and videos. There was uh, sub-modules for Vimeo and YouTube, which we used as well, because uh, Zoos Victoria has a YouTube channel and a Vimeo channel that both have a lot of great content. And um, it kind of gave us the ability to not have to worry about video players. And, and um, it also gave a really nice back-end interface for their content creators to use to manage all of that stuff. Um, lastly, we use the date module. This is in so many Drupal sites. Uh, I probably don't have to give it any introduction, but you know, developers try not to touch any date code if they don't have to. It's such a tricky thing to get around. Um, so when there's a module that's as well maintained as this one that you can use, yeah, it's, it's an absolute no-brainer. In terms of custom modules, uh, there were around 20. I think the majority of them were uh, ones that built or custom, yeah, uh, the majority of them basically were responsible for a single content type or maybe two content types um, and would give the back end interface a lot of the functionality and the front end rendering for that individual content type. Um, we also built a few small custom features like edit in overlay was one of the ones that made a big uh, impact on the user experience. Um, we have uh, a content type called an animal, and we've also got an animal bio. An animal bio represents an actual individual family member, say like an actual lion at the zoo. Um, so some of the am animals will have four or five family members. Um, when you're creating the animal, sometimes you want to populate those fields, but you haven't created the animal bio for each of the family members yet. So the edit in overlay module lets you basically um, pop up a new node edit screen in the overlay, quickly tap that out, save it, and it automatically gets related to the node that you were working on before. Uh, the theme for this site was completely custom. We didn't go with the base theme. Uh, we built it on the HTML5 boilerplate, which is a great place to start for any website. Um, obviously, Drupal comes built in with jQuery, so we used that for a lot of our JavaScript uh, interactions. Um, Modernizer is a key part of the HTML5 boilerplate. For those of you that don't know what it is, it's a JavaScript library that adds a bunch of CSS classes that tell you which features are available on the user's browser who's currently looking at the site. Um, so Modernizer, in combination with your style sheets um, and JavaScript, give you a lot of flexibility about the content that you deliver for that specific user. Um, and to do all of our CSS, we used SAS um, and compiled down to CSS. SAS is a bolt-on on top of CSS that allows you to use a lot of really interesting features like variables and mix-ins, um, which were really, really great for us because, as you'll see in the, th the th uh, themes later, we've got these four distinct brands across the one site. So the Zoos Victoria and the three properties, they have their own color schemes, things like that, but they also share a lot of the theme. <coughs> so uh, using SAS, we were able to write some generic things that were made available to all of our properties, uh, but still gave us the flexibility to change those things quickly and easily without having to rewrite huge swaths of CSS code. Um, so Matt will take you a little bit through some of the key designs on the site. So, um, yeah, we were really happy with, um, with what we were able to achieve uh, during the design phase. Um, I think our design team did a really good job. Um, the client were, re were really happy as well, um, and it, uh, it tested really well too. So, basically, um, the fundamentals of the design when we were approaching it, um, we worked with the zoo on a couple of mood boards. So, what a mood board is, it's rather than sort of diving straight into design, you sort of put together some elements, so that might be some, some types, some colors, some sort of, you know, some illust illustrative elements. So we went with a couple of themes on the mood boards, and then the zoo sort of picked the sort of ones that they liked, and we were able to sort of hone the design in that direction. So what we came through out of that process was a design that was, that was modern and clean, really needed to be that way because there's so much information on this site, um, and, you know, th that information needs to be easily understandable. Um, and also a really important aspect was that it was a playful design. Like the zoo's not all serious. It's in fact, you know, it's it's still a really fun place. So we introduced a lot of playful elements using some hand-drawn illustrations. Um, 
as I've mentioned a few times, the conservation message is really important. The zoos have a philosophy which is called connect, understand and act. And just really simply, that means, okay, so when a user, whether they're at the zoo or at the website or wherever they are, they're having an interaction with the zoo, they're connecting with an animal, so they're seeing, you know, seeing the animal, seeing a great picture of the animal. Then understanding, so that might be just, you know, just understanding one of the, the challenges that that animal faces from a conservation perspective. And then finally act, which is a call to action on how they can do, do more. And that could be a small thing, it could be a large thing. Um, the other sort of aspect of the design phase was they've got four brands. Each brand has their own distinct personality and how to sort of tie that all together but still keep them, um, still keep them their own. So here's the home portal page. Um, it's, um, it's obviously the, uh, the, you know, it's, it's the first port of call when you, when you go to zoo.org.au. Um, as well as um, sort of providing that portal, um, it does provide um, sort of key calls to action for things um, like education and their fighting extinction message. Um, they've got a carousel here where they can, um, you know, they can put in all this great imagery that they've got and link that through to things that are happening at the zoo. Um, so this is the, uh, the Werribee property site. Um, so as you can see, it's sort of a, it marries up well with the, uh, the portal site, but it's got its own personality, and this is the sort of the illustrative design that's coming through to sort of represent elements of the African plains. Um, up in the top right, I'm not sure if you can quite make that out on the screen, but it's got the, uh, the opening hours. You know, it's really simple, but research showed that it was the number one thing that people were looking for, which makes sense. Um, Underneath that, there's kind of six uh, items all around planning your, your, your day, and that was the other thing that um, people were searching for most. These are the six most searched for pages on each site, and so they're you know, you know, front and center, easy to get to up there. So you can see how the design flows through to the different um, properties. This is Melbourne Zoo. It's got its own personality, but it's quite different to Werribee Zoo as well. And Hillsville uh, Sanctuary, the native zoo, which um, I think this is our favourite design, actually. Um, there's a clear fighting extinction message and conservation message running through the site. Um, Lindsay was just going to talk a little bit about how we sort of achieved this with some of the themes, because um, it's, quite, it's quite interesting how, um, how the, sort of the data sort of ties together with the content and the design. So of the four properties, three of them obviously represent the zoos themselves. The fourth one is Zoos Victoria, and they're primarily this conservation organization. So a lot of their content uh, focuses around fighting extinction. Um, you can see uh, straight away on their site, they've got really clear calls to action to fight extinction on e almost every page. Um, but most of the people who go to the pages in the Zoos Victoria site are already interested in that stuff. Um, so one of the other challenges was trying to bring people who are on the zoo property websites through to those conservation pages and get them involved. Um, so there's a few different options for how you can get involved with Zoos Victoria, things like donating or becoming a member of the zoo, which gives you access to their zoos. You can also do things like adopt an animal um, and again, we really wanted to focus on the animals, and it's important that we kind of remember that if they're a zoo, it's really, it's always about the animals. Um, so that was a key thing that we tried to keep on every page. Um, because the animal is the central, we call it the primary content type on their site, um, we really obviously devoted a lot of time to the animals. Um, everything relates back to them across the entire site. Uh, this is the, the animal aggregate page or the animal listing page. For each zoo, you can go to this page and see exactly what animals are there. There's also um, uh, an animal aggregate page on the Zoos Victoria parent site that lists all of the animals from all three zoos. Um, we've talked a bit about their amazing content, they've got so many, like this huge library of awesome, professional, uh, beautiful images of these animals. We really wanted to highlight that for um, the animal listing page, so we built uh, kind of a pin board style page. This was using a JavaScript uh, library called Masonry, uh, which made it really easy, and obviously when that comes together with their awesome images, uh, 
Yeah, it just looks great, and it was really easy to use when we tested. This is an individual animal page. Um, one of the things that I want to point out with this page is the connect, understand, act philosophy and how that comes into practice. So it was that philosophy was um, kind of designed when they were designing the actual enclosures at the zoos. What they would do is you, you get to the enclosure and you see the animal. That's a moment where you kind of like make a connection with that animal. You feel some kind of emotion about it. Um, they usually then have a little placard there that has some information about that animal. Um, and specifically, there's usually at least something about their conservation status and some of the challenges that they face in the wild. Um, so the zoos tries to bring you into to understand what that animal is going through. And then they also try to give you an action that you can take right there because you're in that moment. Um, and they try to make it something that's achievable. This is really different from the way that a lot of nonprofit organizations operate. You'll notice a lot of nonprofits using guilt to try and get people to take action. When you're walking down the street and somebody you know, grabs you and tries to get you to pay $20 a month and you don't have time to talk to them, they really try to like shame you into to, to doing something. And that was something that Zoos Victoria specifically didn't want to do. So they try to, to get you to motivate yourself and they give you something small and achievable that you can do right away. So taking that connect, understand, act um, kind of philosophy <coughs> specifically to the website. On this page, you're greeted with the imagery straight away. You can look, sometimes there's videos or look through an image gallery. Then there's a little bit of information. Um, again, it's general information about the animal, but it al also usually does talk a little bit about um, their conservation status. In the top right, one of the um, things there is their status, which for the seal is least concerned. They're not an endangered species. But for a lot of the other animals, that bar is all the way on the right because they're on the verge of going extinct. And that really shows you like that sometimes critical action is needed. And finally, on the bottom right, we've got um, our contextual calls to action. These are, they're not specifically placed on each page. The zoo's content people create a call to action um, and they'll use an image of a specific animal. And then using that entity reference field, they will relate that CTA, that call to action, to an animal. Um, and then across the whole website, any other piece of content, like an event or a news article that's related to the seal, will show a specific seal call to action. Um, it saves them a lot of time because they don't have to manually place those things on every page. But it also means that there are contextually relevant calls to action um, that try to get you to do something like donate or adopt an animal. And it, it, it gives you that call to action when you're already engaged with that animal. Um, so this is like a really clear illustration of that connect, understand, act philosophy in practice. Um, so Matt's just going to talk you through some of the big wins that we had on this project and some of the things that were really successful. Yeah, so it was, it was a reasonably ambitious project, um, certainly with the time frame and the limited budget uh, and the fact that it, it needed to launch um, on, a particular, on a particular date. Um, so, you know, on reflection, we've got a really happy client and, you know, that's, you know, that, that's fantastic. Um, they're now sort of planning um, new things to do with Drupal um, and so, that, so that's really great. They're actually looking at using Drupal to run a lot of other services including um, other screens around the zoo and maybe even using it for their um, di uh, digital um, asset management. So, so they were really happy. Um, the site launched on time. It's really stable and quick and the old site was just this, you know, a really terrible user experience and now, you know, if you get a chance to jump on the site, you'll see it's really snappy and responsive and, and I think the work that the, the, the dev team did with Nginx has, has really made a massive difference there. Um, it's able to handle high traffic events, which I'll, I'll, just, I'll just talk you through an example. Um, so this, um, this really cute elephant is Mali. Um, Somali was an elephant that was born in uh, captivity three years ago in, in January 2010. Um, whenever they have, um, like, and it doesn't happen very often at all, that, but w when they have a, um, something like this happen, um, it's a big media event. So it was in the papers, it was on, you know, all the news channels that night. It was a really big deal, um, you know, so kind of everywhere you switched on, you, you know, you were seeing Mali and this, you know, these great photos everywhere that is except for the zoo's website because that was down most of the time. 
Um, it was, in fact, the day that they were getting all this publicity, the site was down for five hours. So it was really just a, you know, a, you know, a really bad, um, a bad situation, just a lose-lose for them. So um, it was, um, it was really interesting. A couple of, um, a couple of weeks ago, when uh, we knew that there was another baby elephant on the way, and this was the, 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 the first baby elephant that, that they've had since Mali three years ago. So even though we'd done the load testing, everyone was just like a little bit anxious because they'd had such a bad experience last time. Um, but um, as it turned out, the, uh, the new as yet unnamed elephant um, was born two weeks ago and the site didn't have a hiccup at all. It just, just kept, on, um, kept on going and it was still really snappy and responsive. So I think that's a real testament to the, to the dev team with what they were able to do there. Um, so some of the learnings from the project, um, just to wrap up. Um, phasing was really essential to the project and the way we were able to run those, uh, those con disciplines concurrently, we wouldn't have been able to, to do the site in this time frame if, if we didn't do that. Um, as well as phasing, we also used a sort of a staggered approach. So um, we launched with everything that was important um, to the zoo at that point. If there was anything that they thought they could hold off on, we said, well, let's, let's launch that um, post-launch. And, you know, sometimes people think that that's, you know, some kind of failure, but, you know, it was certainly something that was essential and that everyone kind of worked together to make sure that that, was, uh, that, that worked well. And it, it did work really well. Um, as I mentioned before, with just the, the example of the, the, the baby elephant, like load testing, just knowing that if you're working on a high traffic site that it is going to hold up, um, it does give you a lot of peace of mind. Um, and um, content, yeah, I, I mean, we've spoken a lot about content. Um, content really is king. And, um, you know, just going through a proper phase just to sort of, just to analyse that and make sure you've got all the content priorities in order is, is really important. Um, the final one, which I don't have have on here, it's just I think it's like when you're working on a site like this between an agency and a client, um, it's really important to have that mutual trust. And I don't think we would have been able to do any of this if there was sort of you know a distrust between the two organisations, because we, frankly, we didn't really have the time or the space to sort of you know to be kind of battling each other on things. I mean, sure, you know, have those important discussions, but um, you know, work through them quickly and then trust that you know you know, we're the experts in some, thing, some things and they're the experts in other things and we just keep moving like that. So, um, yeah, so thanks a lot for, um, for, for coming along and listening. Um, we've got a little bit of time if, if, you, if anyone had any questions at all. Um, happy if you uh, bump into either of us sort of around the rest of DrupalCon if you want to chat as well. So, um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, just, just let us know. Uh, Donna, hi. hi. <laughs> yeah. yeah. something that as an organization we're only just starting to do um, and one of the one of the important things in that is like a dialogue with the client it's really important uh, to kind of get the client involved in the open source philosophy when they're benefiting from Drupal um, it's something that we've done a little bit uh, with a different organization DCNA the breast cancer network in Australia um, they have sponsored quite a few bug fixes and feature developments for the Salesforce modules, um, but we haven't actually contributed any whole modules as an organization. One of the ones that we are going to look at contributing that we built for this project is a small MUNX toolkit um, that we developed just to allow the zoo's administrators to do things like create a specific page out of the MUNX page on demand, um, but we'll look at doing that mm. once the community's got a little bit more time. Yeah, no, it's definitely something we want to do and something that we I think it's just probably a reflection of the speed that this project's um, had to travel at, that um, probably that's one of the things that's sort of that's next on the list. Definitely, yeah. yeah was, did, did you have a question? Yeah, Mike? Yeah, Lindsay as well. It, it wasn't actually multi-site, was it? That, um, yeah, we. Uh, it, it wasn't a multi-site in the case of being on different domains. It was a single domain, and we basically <coughs> uh, had.
the main site, and then we have three sub-sites. Um, we've worked on a few multi-site uh, installations in the past, and this one was one where, because it's one organization, we wanted to keep it still kind of cohesive. Um, what we ended up doing is we defined a content type called a property, and that property represented one of the three zoos for um, the Beavatoria organization itself. Um, and we built a lot of functionality around managing things like home pages uh, for each of those properties. So the custom module that we built to manage that content type is probably the biggest one across the entire site. Um, it really wasn't all that complex. We just did it based on URLs. Uh, if the beginning of the URL was Melbourne or wherever you were queuing from, which was the, we call it the stub of that content, of that um, property node. Uh, basically, we just put a special class onto our body, and we used that for all of the different stylings. Um, everything else was basically just based on menu structure. Uh, we had one menu that had Zoos Victoria and the other three properties as the root nodes, and everything living under one of those. Um, and again, that was how we did our URL structure, which allowed us to do that. Um, so we kind of went with a bit of a custom thing. We had done something similar with a project, uh, Radio Australia, previously, um, that has seven different streams for different countries and languages. Um, because we had kind of had experience doing it that way for them, we just decided to do it the same way since we knew it. Um, so the iPhone is something that, as I was saying during the talk, they've got a multi because we had to launch in a tight time frame, the way that the iPhone app is currently working is it's a little bit divorced from Google. It's a custom build that mainly uses uh, something called the web view. So everything in the app is HTML and CSS. It's all packaged in a zip file that the, um, the iPhone app basically is bundled with. The iPhone app basically regularly checks a URL um, on a server to see if there's a new version of that zip file. So when they want to bundle some new content into the app, what they do <coughs> is um, they actually currently go into a backend that's based on the Zen framework. They make some modifications and they hit publish, and that takes all of their new HTML images and JavaScript and bundles it into a new zip, and it puts it at a URL that will tell the iPhone app that there's um, new content available in the form of an app update. What we're going to end up doing in the future, this is phase for development this year, is that we will replace that Zend interface with something that um, pulls in content from the Drupal API that has been launched for the mobile app. Um, so the actual app itself isn't doesn't need to be connected to the internet. It's not pulling things in straight from Drupal over an API. Uh, we kind of go through an intermediate step where we bundle everything for them so that they can use the uh, app completely offline. One of the main reasons that we did that is because it's really hard to get internet access reliably across all of the three zoos, and we wanted to make sure that people wanted to use the app while they were on the property um, until they can do some of those infrastructure upgrades that will help them get better wireless bandwidth on that property. Uh, you want to trust them to have everything in their hands when they get there. Yeah. Um, I hope so. <laughs> selling any additional things inside there, so um, they don't force you to use their update mechanisms if there's something kind of that you need to do. Any other questions? One, one of the first things we did was we got them to undertake a content audit. So, you know, basically that's a big, a big spreadsheet that they work through. And they've, they've got a lot of content owners from, from the different departments. So they've got people like the zookeepers, people who are in charge of the, the, the different three properties, people who are um, in charge of education. So there's all these different content owners. So we said, 
right, you go to the go to your content owners and cull everything that that you can. You know, so really just you know go through it because this is probably the the only opportunity you're going to have for the next you know three or three or four years to do this. So they were really good. So that so they culled all that and then we brought all that back into a workshop and just started to go through it all. Then we just started bringing in all the content owners into this workshop and then just sort of interviewing them. Um, a lot of whiteboards. We just started, you know, prioritising things on the whiteboard, um, and then took all this information away. It was like a four-hour session. It was pretty intense. Took all that away and then analysed it. Came back, sat down with them, and said, "Look, this is what we think." We iterated over that a couple of times, and we eventually got um, got to sort of have knowing the content priorities. Um, and then through there, there was a wireframe process which our IA architect worked through. Um, then that went through to testing to get some validation. Um, from, from some third party testing, that was really useful and it actually confirmed that we were really on the right track. There was a couple of little tweaks we made and then we got to the point where we could start start designing based on those wireframes. There's just something I wanted to say about mm -hmm. that as well, um, which is that when you're working with an organization that is really intimate with their own content and their experts in their own field, it's really easy for the client to lose sight of what their users want and need. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the zoos, for the people who are visiting the zoo, it's, it's all about the animals. But um, for someone at the zoo organization who's been working with the zoo website for all of this time, um, they put a lot of different priorities on things like campaigns and events. That's what's foremost in their mind. And a lot of times, uh, if you have that trust with them, you just have to force them to try to take a step back and um, go to some real users to get some real feedback um, and then try to integrate that again what their business needs are. Great. Anyone else? Thanks so much, Ryan. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if, if you get a chance um, to evaluate the session, um, please do so. And yeah, say hi. Enjoy the rest of the, uh, the conference. Yeah.